Um, we're going to do, um, I like to ask a lot of questions. Um, first, I, I, um, my, one of my partners is here, uh, Phil Manfredi. While we were at the state, uh, Phil was my chief strategy officer. And I used to tell Phil all the time that strategy is the easy part. All you have to do is Google it. And then you read and you read and you read and it all starts to sound the same. So uh, we do a lot of reading, uh, a lot of different things. So absolutely want to thank WSO2 for having us here today. I um, want to thank you guys for sitting in on this session. A little bit about myself. Uh, I do consider myself a recovering CIO. Um, being state CIO for, for Arizona was pretty intense. Um, we had 32,000 employees. We had over 100 different data centers, a lot of aging infrastructure that was falling down all around me. Um, worked for United Health Group, Intel, Microsoft, Senelect, a couple other companies here and there in between. Um, recently in January, Phil and then another gentleman, Kieran, and I left the state and decided to start our own company. I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, but back to kind of how Asanka introduced himself, you know, if I could have been, I should have been a pirate. Um, so that was absolutely my calling. I was just born in the wrong time, wrong place. Last year I was here and, and gave, a, gave a talk and we talked about, and this is totally is in line with what Asanka was saying as well, is don't call it the WSO2 platform. Don't call it a specific product. You know, give it a name, give it a brand, give it something that people can, can talk about. Because normally there's, there's other components beyond just the WSO2 components and there's the value add that you add to the platform as you start to develop your platform as well. And so ours was called the Arizona Enterprise Services Platform. And I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail here. I'll, I'll kind of summarize at the end and come back and talk about this a little bit. We had a pretty, pretty in-depth deployment. We had over 350 different instances in the Amazon cloud um, using a lot of different Amazon capabilities and some other cloud capabilities alongside our legacy infrastructure and in the, in the, in the WSO2 infrastructure as well. So I'm not gonna spend time here, but I, I'll come back to it. Um, we joke about this a lot, um, you know, so how do you pronounce it's Zugand? Um, now, where did it come from? Um, when we were starting, how many of you have ever watched Silicon Valley, the, the show off of HBO, right? If you've ever watched that show, and if you haven't, you really should, it's pretty funny, but coming up with a company name is nearly impossible. Um, so we, we had several that we played with, but we kind of played with two different uh, German words that turned out for Zug for train and Andern. Um, for change, I'm sure I totally butchered that. No, we're not German, but we just wanted a cool name. So that's how we took those two words and, and really created the engine of change is, is where Zuggen comes from. What do we do? Um, we like technology, we love technology, we like change. Uh, we like to help organizations with change. And so digital transformation is a really interesting spot to be involved in right now. There's a lot of things going on in that space. But really what we do is we just ask a lot of questions. Um, how many of you ever read the book, um, A More Beautiful Question? How many of you can read? For those that you can't read that didn't raise your hand, um, you can check out Audible. I absolutely love Audible. Um, and this is one of the books that, that, we've, that we recommend to all of our teams that when we work with them. But A More Beautiful Question really talks about, you know, how do you ask better questions? How do you ask a more beautiful question when you're working with folks? And so these are kind of four core questions that we ask. Hopefully I did my math right. Um, when, we're, when we're talking to folks, and that is, you know, how, do we, how, do, how might we create a new experience for our customers and new, set new expectations for our customers? How might we reimagine business outcomes? How might we innovate the outcomes and the op you know, those, those operational models that support that? And then how do we disrupt how it's always been done? That's, that's always a huge challenge. Whenever we're dealing with folks, it's, well, this is the way it's always been done, or this is my job, or this is my button, I push this button. Right? So how do you get people to start to think how they could do it differently? And so we ask a lot of different questions. There's a great article, and I don't know how many of you guys have seen it. Um, it was, there was, an art, there was a, a research paper developed by Open Matters and Deloitte, and then it was published on Harvard Business Review. And the title of it is, What Airbnb, Uber, and Alibaba All Have in Common? And how many of you guys are tracking all the new unicorns? right? All the billion dollar plus companies. There was a new infographic that came out last week and there's just more and more of these, these unicorn companies. And, you know, by the definition of a unicorn, it doesn't exist. And so we always talk about, um, 
you know, not necessarily unicorns, but next generation giants. We're saying that there probably is a methodology, there's a framework, there's an approach, there's, this is happening and it's happening more and more out there. There are new, there are more billion dollar organizations that are coming. There's also existing large organizations that are trying to reinvent themselves and can use those same approaches, those same frameworks, those same technologies, those same skills in order to take advantage of these, these new strategies as well. And so I wanna spend quite a bit of time here in my short little bit of time talking about this article and kind of dissecting this article and dissecting the paper and really encouraging you to go out and find this article and, and download it. There are, th there are essentially three key lessons that, were from, that came out from this research. The first one is they identified four different business models. The first one is asset builders, they build things. The second one is service providers, they, they do things for folks. The third one is technology creators. They code things that allow other people to use them. And then the fourth one is a network orchestrator. The second key lesson that they learned from this is that network orchestrators create a exponentially amount of more value than the other ones. And it is a very different business model. And the third lesson to that is that few companies operate as network orchestrators. And so I'm only gonna focus on the third point in this, in this discussion today. If you wanna talk about the other ones, please find me. It's in the research as well. Um, the article's a relatively short article, but at the bottom of the article, there's a bunch of links and those links go to other things, including like a 60 page paper, as well as a digital survey that you can go through and kind of assess your own organization. Highly recommend it, great stuff. But I wanna dig into you know, what is a network orchestrator and why are so few companies that way? And so in, this, in the research, they really define a network orchestrator as you make many, sell many. And you know, you create and manage your networks that could be social information, it could be information sharing, it could be marketplaces. So obviously, you know, Airbnb, Uber, Alibaba fall into this. I started to create a slide with all a bunch of other ideas and examples and I just stopped and went back to the basics. But use your imagination, you can kind of start to figure it out. Um, you know, how do you create and orchestrate and facilitate, you know, these type of exchanges? So back to the, the lessons here, why do so few companies operate or organizations operate as network orchestrators? Well, it also talks about this in the research. And so three example, three things that they really found out through the research was, first one is network orchestration requires new technologies and competencies. It's hard, right? And we all know that, that's why we come to things like this. This is the jobs and the careers that we have. These things are challenging, they're difficult at times. The second one, many of you may not be thinking about often that generally accepted accounting principles don't encourage leaders to invest in customers, sentiment, and networks. I can't enforce how important that is and how critical that's been to our success. We spent an immense amount of time educating, training, building relationships with our leadership and especially our finance people so that we could overcome that challenge, so that we could change things. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then the third one was most enterprises have very siloed thinking. How many of you guys come from an organization that has very siloed thinking, right? Makes things challenging. And the other thing that's kind of scary from that perspective is it also puts those organizations at risk for other organizations to identify solutions that tear down those silos and create new network orchestration models that can challenge your existing organization. So it, it, it's very risky to your organization to continue to operate that as well. And that's what this, this article talks about. So, so how can you, back to all these questions, right? How can you overcome these challenges while you're implementing a new network orchestration business model? And so this wasn't in the research. This is kind of my abstracted value add to this, to this conversation today. But the first one is, you know, can you mitigate the risks and to implementing new technology and competencies, right? The second one is, you know, can you implement a, a new outcome-based metric system within your organization? And then the third one is, how do you start to break down those silos before your competition does? So first one, Obviously, you know, WSO2. WSO2, we've been working with them for nearly four years now. Um, three keys just briefly, and, and you're, you're hearing about it throughout here, and it's gonna be kind of a repeat from what a lot of people are saying, but the three that I would say is, first one is standardized platform approach. So back to new technology and capabilities and skills are risky. You, by, by choosing vetted platforms, 
um, standardized platforms, you can start to standardize and start to focus in on those areas. The second part is how do you reduce that investment? We used to talk often that, you know, working for state government, we have insanely limited budgets. And we used to talk that there are three components to, to making the investment. There's a licensing component to it, there's a maintenance component to it, and there's a services component. And I can do two, but I can't do three. And so many vendors will come in with a solution that gives you all three of those, and it's just way too pricey for the approaches that we had. And so we really looked, open source was such a, a viable investment for us because we didn't necessarily have to pay the licensing part of it, but we paid the maintenance and we paid for the support and services because they're mission critical systems. And so, so that's where you know, I, I really think from an open source perspective is, was really important to us and working with WSO2. And then the last part was you need something that's scalable. You have to do a proof of concept that says that this is gonna work. You gotta start small. Then you start to pilot it with specific use cases and then you push it into production. And you just continue that cycle of proof of, proof of concept pilot production. And, and over time, it grows. Like I mentioned, we had over 350 instances in Amazon r running WSO2 to support our infrastructure. Also, we've done a, a lot of soul searching. Many of you have probably seen iterations of this, but when we, when we left, we, we really took a lot of time to look back at, okay, if we had to do this over again, what would we do? How would we do it different? What a different approach would we have? And on the, the left-hand side there was really what we did while we were at the state is we, we focused on enterprise architecture and core capabilities and horizontal solutions, right? And we really looked at it holistically of what we would have to do in order to support this. And you know, where would we be 10 years from now, right? We all love that stuff. I mean, that's, that's that strategic architecture side of things and it's so exciting and it's so cool, right? And pretty soon your money runs out. Pretty soon your time runs out. Pretty soon your resources run out and it's, it's hard to get that stuff. And even more importantly for us was that stuff underneath the covers, well, it's cool and it's exciting and it's fun for us, is just not sexy when you're talking to the legislature or the governor and being able to show them that, hey, look at our ESB, it's really awesome, right? And so you've gotta be able to show something and that's why I, we really like this, this model on the right here that says, if you're gonna do something, focus on a sliver. That's the MVP, that's that minimum viable approach, right? So focus on that sliver, make sure that you, you know, start with that proof of concept, that pilot production, and then instead of building up, build sideways, you know, build out your wedge that way. And so that was a huge lesson learned for us. Um, the second part of how, right, I mentioned was you have to implement new outcome-based metrics, right? Again, I'm a big reader, who's read um, Lean Startup by Eric Ries? Okay. If you have not, you absolutely need to read that about five times. Um, and that's where a minimum viable product really comes from. But in that book, he talks about innovation accounting. And innovation accounting, and, and they even talk about how you shouldn't, you shouldn't even write a piece of code until you absolutely know that you have customer demand for it. And that's a lot of what the book is written about. And it's about how to structure your development, your development processes and environments to be able to test theories, a lot of split testing, A-B testing, to be able to see, you know, is, is this new feature even of interest to people, right? Put out a button, see how many people click on it, depending on how many people click on it, then decide if you're gonna roll out that new capability and feature, right? And it's, it's really about that. And so it, it goes into, it, you know, is this a new product that I should launch? Is this a new feature that I should launch? It also helps with adoption of a capability or feature or product. It helps with marketing your solution and your, and your different services through your solution that way as well you need to really build those capabilities into your process. And so that innovation accounting is a really critical part that you really need to talk to your team about and get them thinking about it and acting on it. Um, when Eric, he's had several failures, he's had some great successes, but that's the way they implement everything that they do. The second thing is, and this, is, this was covered you know, very, a, a ton in, in the material, um, my wife works for a very large organization. She's the, the Hadoop program manager, has been for several years. She's, she's gone through, I would say, probably four, four different um, generations of big data and business analytics and business information and all that fun stuff, data warehousing. And we, we talk all the time about, you know, what type of an organization can be successful with big data. 
and you know this was a, a Sunday morning sitting on the patio drinking coffee conversation and we really kind of came up with there's really two organizations that two types of organizations that are going to be successful with big data the first one is your big organization that is going to retool itself and change and implement new data and change how it does in order to take advantage of big data right and that can be pretty costly and it takes a massive leadership commitment from an organization to really take advantage and change an organization the other side are these next generation giants these unicorns that have been birthed with business intelligence with big data at the core foundation of those organizations so then this again is back to you either need to change and become this or these types of organizations are going to come in and they're going to threaten your existence so you really need to think about what are those new network assets, right? Again, think back to the generally accepted accounting principles. Those principles don't take into effect that there is any value in a network. They don't think that there's any value in, in semantics and sediment about your organization. And so, so you really need to work with your finance folks. You need to work with your leadership to create this new innovation accounting. You need to identify new types of, of assets. And then you have to be able to run those analytics on those assets in association with that new innovation accounting. So the third, the third way of how to do this um, is, is to break down these silos. And this is where, where we spend a lot of time working with organizations, building solutions out right now. And we've kind of summarized it into everybody's got to have three bullet points, right? So the three bullet points that we talk about often is you got to be able to connect, you got to be able to personalize it, and you got to be able to interact. It's been pretty interesting. The whole morning was really about customer experience. Um, we absolutely believe that. That's the, the foundation of everything, all the conversations that we're having right now about transformation, about strategy. It's about that customer experience. Um, anything that you read out there right now from Forrester or from Gartner, everybody's really pushing in that direction. You really have to think about it. You know, how do I connect? How do I make it easy, right? While we were at the state, that was one of our biggest challenges. Every single state agency is a silo. They all have their own active directory. They all have their own email services. They all have their own contractor repositories, business, you know, customer repositories. None of these systems work together. And so one of our strategies was to implement the identity and access management solution from WSO2 to help us to try to start, you know, implementing specific connection solutions for specific use cases. So you got to make it easy. You got to be able to, you know, e leveraging social, social connectivity and enterprise information all at the same time is absolutely critical. And you really have got to be able to use that identity to create that 360 degree view around that customer. And those customers can be internal, they can be external. While we were at the state, we always talked about citizens, businesses, and employees. Those were very specific customer groups that we were always talking about different use cases with. The second thing is personalization. Um, Netflix thinks I'm, I'm really messed up. Um, they, <laughs> they think that I'm either a, a six to 10 year old little girl or I love to blow things up right and you know when you mush that together that's pretty messed up some of the things that it suggests that I watch um, and that's probably how my house is most of the time but you know so you know we, we talk about analytics so much and we're, we're so into trying to figure out how do we use all this data to do it that sometimes we forget that you know what, it's really easy just to ask the customer right what are you interested in right I think Andrew mentioned earlier that you know he, he bought a ha new heart monitor for his arm and then for the next couple of weeks he keeps getting ads on this right you know well wouldn't it be nice to be able to ask your customer are you still interested in a heart rate monitor or can I interest you in a new pair of sneakers right instead of just continuing to use that that predictive analytics and that big data and and trying to guess what people are you know you've got to start to think about how do I allow customers to personalize that how I'll allow them to opt in and opt out and to choose specific things because otherwise the predictive data can can tick them off just as much as is not doing it at all um, so so we, we we urge people to think through that think through what those use cases are and be able to to have solutions for that and then the last thing is is how do you interact 
And I think you've got to spend a lot of time thinking through that. There's, there's a lot of different thoughts and, and philosophies out there. Um, I really liked uh, Forrest, the Forrester approach this morning, talking about these, these perishable moments or this perishable information, right? There, there, there are certain points in time where being able to act on that or be able to make offers or to be able to send information is critical. And if you miss it, it's past, right? Um, my, my partner the other day had a flat tire and, you know, if, if the car would have been smart enough to call out somebody to come and fix it right then, that's awesome. But instead, you know, if you get notification for the next two weeks on, you know, hey, if you get a flat tire, you know, call us. That does absolutely no good because it doesn't normally happen very often. And so you really got to start to think about what are those moments, what are those activities, and again, back to, I'm gonna go back to the lean startup. You have to be able to think through, how do you get this feedback? Is this gonna be a viable feature? Is this gonna be a good feature? Throw that into your innovation accounting before you start to develop all this stuff. And you've gotta be able to do this split testing um, to make sure that you know, this version is better than that version or this view is better than this view. Or, and you may have to understand who your customers are, that you may have an, an, el- an older population that has issues reading small screens. You may need a bigger version. So, so those are the types of things that really go into that interact as we, as we talk about it. But breaking down those styles is absolutely critical. So coming back to the state just real quick. Um, A lot's happening at the state. There's some really good things. Working in state government can be absolutely a challenge. Um, On the far left-hand side, you can see we have some critical um, repositories of user information. We have our HR system that has over 32,000 active employees, plus another 60, 70,000 retirees, people that don't work there anymore. So there's over 100,000 employees that, that could be accessing state systems. Plus then we have the citizens and depending on which agency and which use case you're talking about there, Arizona has 6.6 million um, citizens that live there currently and then people that have moved in, moved out, you know, that can, that can get pretty crazy when you start to think about that. Then there's also the business directory. If you, if you think about every company that does business in Arizona has to register and become licensed in the state, well, that's very valuable information to other agencies to be able to access that information. You know, so for example, over on the, the right-hand side here, on the top, it's a little hard to see, I'm sure, but you have the Arizona Corporation Commission, which is responsible for licensing and registering those organizations organizations. Well, the second organization that's listed there is the Department of Environmental Quality. So they had a manual process where the customer, the business, would manually enter a form, send the form in, DEQ would take the form, manually enter it into the system, then would get a data download on a monthly basis from the Arizona Corporation Commission, check the spelling of the name, make sure it was a legitimate viable business in Arizona, then go back and make the corrections manually in the system right? And so we worked on a project where we used the data services server to create APIs within those two repositories so that we could start to integrate that work together. Um, And then used API manager, you know, throughout. um, And then that really ties back into that core Arizona Enterprise Services hub for, for, for displaying all this information. Um, the the kind of second tier under the middle there is some of the kind of core capabilities that we were working on implementing. So for example, you got your single sign-on, multi-factor authentication, payment processing APIs, an employee directory, an Arizona business directory, services. So, so that really starts to become our enterprise store of APIs and capabilities and applications and services. So Obviously, these are long journeys, and especially in a, in a large organization, this stuff takes time, and you just got to hack on it and just keep going on it, and you have to have a good strategy. But a lot of the, the principles from this article, this network orchestration model, were really core to how we were operating. How can we become this facilitator, this broker, this orchestrator within a large organization? Um, so just to summarize, just briefly, you got to be able to mitigate those risks pick a good technology, pick a good partner. We absolutely believe in WSO2. We're still a good partner with them, doing some different projects with them. Second thing is you gotta change your metrics. You gotta change how you talk about things. You gotta change who you're talking with. You gotta basically invent a new accounting system and there's, there's a lot of great resources to really help you out with that. The third one is you really got to think about how are you breaking down those silos, right? And we absolutely believe in you got to connect. You got to make it easy for your users to connect. You got to be able to personalize that information to that user and focus on that customer experience. You got to have great interactions. And then last but not least, you know, you always have to take action and show results.
So um, with that, thank you all very much.